consequences of most deterioration of conservation have to do with consumption and economic activity and demographics and so forth. Um, and so is our way of taking resources from biodiversity conservation and putting it to the root causes. Um, and I'm not sure that there's many opinions about this. My, my personal opinion is, is that, you know, you, I see this as sort of a continuum, right, where there are root causes and then there are more proximate causes. And it's not necessary for everybody to work on just one part, but we can work along the way, right? Um, so some, you know, there are some organizations that work at demographics or about poverty alleviation or con consumption. And particularly many of our partners in the wider environmental community are concerned about those things. And then there's other groups, like my group, tends to work much more, much more approximately. Um, I think in terms of resources, the place we should look for is not, um, as we might say, from Peter to pay Paul, right? This is what Christians might say. But um, rather to look to where all the resources are. So not the little, the little flows that kind of go into the good things, but the big, huge flows, like Belinda was talking about, that go into other sectors. You know, if we could get 10% of the money that we spend on dog food every year, and put that into <laughs> conservation, whether it's the root causes or the proximate causes, I think that, you know, that could have a lot more effect. Um, I was once at a meeting and uh, someone gave a very passionate talk about uh, African wild dog conservation. And at the end she suggested, and they spend so much money on tigers and elephants. Why do they do that? They should put more money into African wild dogs. And I think that's, that's just beating ourselves up within the conservation community, rather than to look you know, it's the, the true wealth and abundance of this world and this creativity and this economic activity and trying to, I think, mainstream is a good word, our values and our, our interests into the larger uh, activities of the world. Thank you. I actually, if you could just stay for a minute, I actually wanted to ask you particularly too because no, I, I really enjoyed, it, it could be yeah. for everybody too, yeah, sure. I, enjoyed, I enjoyed your talk and, and yet, I, I still feel that at the end of the day, if, if I understood it right, the main goal was still to find the largest um, tracts of uh, undisturbed land, and those are the places to concentrate. And my question is if we need to, it seems on the one hand, everybody is talking about changing that strategy and looking at social issues and looking actually more where the human and, and natural world are coming together. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, why, why to, to, in the end of the day, focus there and not on the intermediate places where, where, where we're really losing the battle and where mm -hmm. we still have a chance to work, whereas those big tracks, in a way, it's a, it's a simpler solution. Maybe difficult to get the money, but a simpler solution. Right, right. Well, I, I think, I, again, I think for myself that the key point about the human footprint is it actually allows you to ask that question about, the question was about resource allocation sort of along the gradient of human influence, right? So, so should you should you put the should you put your most of your money into the places that are are being most hammered by infrastructure, most influenced by infrastructure, or sh should you go for the wild places, or or, 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 or the immediate places, right? So, so you could uh, I'm, I'm going to try and do this in an Israeli context. You know, should your conservation money go into Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, or into the agricultural areas or into the, the patchwork reserve system that Israel has. Um, and again, I, I think um, there isn't one answer. I, I, what I, it's important to me is a complementary set of answers, right? <laughs> that we are working across that. So I think we need to be talking to the people that are planning your cities and your infrastructure and your roads about how their activities affect conservation. We should be talking to the, the farmers and the fish people that are running the fish ponds down below about how that affects, and then we should be also managing our protected areas. And if you ask me what the right to the right allocation of funds, and this is maybe where we want you to come up, um, is I, I think you know a, a good chunk of funds should go into the wild places because my theory of change for the next hundred years is that nature is going to continue to contract and contract and contract. But hopefully we will then get to a point where the global population will stabilize and the global level of consumption will stabilize. And that'll allow us to plan for the 22nd century, right? Which will be a very different world than the world we know. So right now, I think um, sometimes we have to make some hard decisions, the kind of things that Leanna and Belinda over here were talking about. Maybe sometimes we're going to have to give up in order to save more of other things. Um, but for me, it's it's not about it's not just about now. It's about 
the 22nd century, right? And what are we going to pass on to that generation so that they can make their own decisions about conservation and development? Do you have a question to Professor Boitani? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I want to know if there is uh, some common policies in Europe about how to handle the question of losses of livestock to, uh, to wolf or bear predation. And who is doing that and how it works? No, there is no common uh, policy. Every country has its own uh, legislation. <coughs> and even within a country, you may have uh, uh, independent decision at the local level. For example, Spain is divided in independent uh, comunidad. They are called province, and each one has a different rule. Uh, in fact, the wolf is protected in certain of these provinces and not in others. Uh, Italy has a regional uh, structure, and we do have wolves in 14 different regions, and we have 14 different legislations <laughs> of, uh, of uh, compensation. Uh, but basically, uh, I can tell you that m most of Europe, I would say all European countries, compensate the damage done by uh, large carnivores in general, and sometimes also for other, other species. But so all of them provide for um, prevention uh, measure, you know, compensation, mm -hmm. some control. So it's a it's a quite complicated issue, but it is not ruled by Brussels. It's at national level. Any more? In all these conservation plans, I mean, both population viability analysis planning as one, and also, and then the systematic conservation planning. There is a small literature growing in that area of dynamic conservation planning, which really also gets back to Eric's point and the previous question is, what is the time frame? So what, what, how do you deal with time frames? Um, the work with New Zealand, they said, we're setting up 50 year projects. And I think most of that may have some climate change issues at the back of some of their ideas on some projects. I'd say most conservation projects don't have climate change factored in yet, they will. It's, it's not, a, not a problem, it's just another threat it's just this highly uncertain threat that's going to change through time. Now, where we have problems, I think, is almost all the fundamental mathematics, the simple mathematics, is all static. There's no time frame. And the mathematics of making sequential decisions in a stochastic, uncertain world uh, is quite messy. And the tool is stochastic dynamic programming, uh, which is, it hurts your head a lot to do it. <laughs> we, we have done it. We have done it in many papers. We, we can show how to do optimal allocations through time with uncertainty, with projected trends that may or may not come true. But all those papers are entirely useless. <laughs> I mean, because they're, 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 they're fundamental conceptual stuff that is probably, but then again, the first systematic conservation planning papers in 1980 <coughs> probably everybody thought, everybody thought they were useless. Now, Mark Sand and Sea Plan are changing the face of 10 to 20% of the entire surface area of the world. So my view is that, you know, it's, it's, I like the fact, so, so we can do it, the tools are there, it's harder, it means everybody, the agencies, the NGOs, everybody's technical skills have to go up. You know, we need, we need po politicians who understand probability. We need them to understand scenarios and <laughs> uncertainties. Now, I think actually the climate change people are doing us a big favour, you know, all this dispute. But at least, you know, they've got those trajectories, they've got scenarios, they've got uncertainties. It's Politicians have been forced to understand risk and probability. And if we're going to do projections for conservation under climate change, we're going to have to use more of them. And maybe, you know, I dream of a world in 10 or 20 years' time where, you know, these things actually can be discussed publicly, not sort of in universities. We can talk about probabilities. Well, the Dutch, they give weather forecasts and they give you a probability of rain, okay? Maybe that's, and that's what everybody should do. Because, you know, in, in a country like Australia, obviously, we are too stupid to understand probability. They tell us it's gonna rain or it's not gonna rain. But of course, their models, their models would never say that. Their models will actually say it's a 40% chance of rain. But for some reason, some moron in the media says that is too complicated for the Australian public. 
But of course, they all gamble every day. <laughs> um, and they won't understand probability, so we'll ignore it. So I, I, I think we, you know, literally the society has just got to deal with more technical things, and that's going to help us deal with making decisions under uncertainty. But it, it, it requires everybody within the game. Really. OK. Yes? Yeah, there's a lot of worry in wildlife conservation, in particular about China. Uh, not only is China a really huge country and very diverse, and and very, very full of people, right? But also China, in, in the ways of those allocated in the influence maps I was showing, a lot of the resources, China's sucking resources, and particularly wildlife resources, out of a, a goodly portion of, of Asia. So, um, I mean, in terms of my, my institution, we work at sort of the policy level with China, and then we work with them at the landscape planning area, with the project in Tibet, and they're working on tigers in the northern part of China and so forth. But um, personally, I think what's important is to try and talk to the Chinese in Chinese terms. So these, these values discussions that were mentioned, I think, almost, almost universally by the speakers this morning, you know, we need to talk to the Chinese about their values. What are their values for conservation? And we need um, to find the people that can make the argument in the vernacular and in the way that Chinese people think about the world in such a way that they, um, you know, they help conserve the world. I, I get to meet a culture that does not have those ideas in them, and, it, and in fact, I'm married to a Chinese woman, that's a woman from Taiwan, and they do have those ideas. In fact, there's probably no artist conservationist I know more than my wife will hit you on the head if you do something bad to the environment. So, <laughs> um, um, so I just think we need to talk to them, and, and Indians as well. Um, the sooner the better. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. But you know, there's there's the challenges within your country, right? And we saw we heard a lot of national examples. And then the challenges across countries. And we also need to be dealing with those, taking into account the way national identity is formed and shaped. I have a question to the panel. Uh, 